Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I am joined here with my beautiful friend, Angie Tillman, who's also from Georgia. And we're actually filming this on a Thursday, even though this is going to air on Friday. And today we released our our withheld video. We held it back for a while with, with you and Eric over the Telegram cults. And we went through the bite model and we went through the seduced website at the red flags of a high control organization. And I have to say, guys, we've gotten so many wonderful responses. Um, And that was the whole point of us doing this, that episode in this episode today. It's it's not necessarily to commiserate, but it's more to be like, hey, you know what? It's okay. Like this shit happens. We've been through it. We've been through narcissistic relationships. We've we've gotten caught in high controlled organizations. And so we're using ourselves as examples and also talking about kind of the clinical um, perspective of this so that you guys know that you're not alone and that there's help out there and it's okay. But before that, Angie, I have an idea and I was going to wait to tell you this on air. So I'm going to shock you. You know those little dances on TikTok people do? Yeah. You want to do one with me? You know, I can't dance. You well, know, I was asked to be in Dancing with the Athens Stars. And I had to meet like two, three times a week with this girl to practice, 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 practice. Because I am so like I, uncoordinated in that way. Um, and then they canceled it. It was in the year of 2020. You're like, thank God. I know. Now, okay, so <laughs> this, I love this song for some reason, and I love this dance, and I was like, I should see if Angie Tillman will do this with me. <laughs> I love right. this dance and song. So y'all, do you want to do it right now, or can we practice? <laughs> oh, we can totally. Oh, I need to practice, girl. We need, I need. I need to practice. But we need to show them how sexy us Southern girls who okay. were born women, who were actually born with the uterus. Yeah, I was about to say, if I got to do it right now, can I go put on a bra? Because <laughs> they're kind of, you know, just out there right now. <laughs> I know you can't really see them because of what I'm wearing, but you know, I I'm like, say, I do always have a bra on because I got boobs, but there may have been times I've been sitting in my panties without. <laughs> so, uh, I also want to say something too, because this is going to be aired on Friday, this Saturday, um, July 15th. There is a psychic fair that is happening at, um, Ashtang Yoga Atlanta, but it's done, uh, we uh, rent space to my friend Tiffany, who uh, runs Healing Hands Reiki, nonprofit here in Atlanta, and they have a psychic fair once a month. And so that's a great, I'm trying to talk Angie into coming. I'll be there in the afternoon. It's like $20 at the door. It goes to the nonprofit, and they have all sorts of uh, Reiki practitioner, numerologists, astrologers, Akashic record readers, mediums, tarot card readers, holistic practitioner, divinator, psychic, spirit artist. I don't know what that is. I guess I'll find out intuitives, palmist and crystal healers. And so they, again, uh, my friend Tiffany with her nonprofit, they do this uh, healing hands, raking spiritual development. They do this once a month. Um, they rent, she rents. That's how we became friends. She rents space from AYA. So there's Tiffany. So it's all at AYA. And I have, I've, I've been to a few of these before. They keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's pretty cool. Um, I can't wait to see who the vendors are on Saturday and um and yeah so if you're in the atlanta area and you want to come on by for the psychic fair again it's about twenty dollars at the door you can get your t tickets pre-hand if you want to or you can pay at the door and um it's a great way to connect with other people in the wacky world of spirituality that we all find or the, the true the true great awakening spirituality so anyway i just wanted to make that say that very quickly um and if you if you are somebody who is a spiritualist in the atlanta area and you want to rent a booth for the next psychic fair you can talk to tiffany about that while you are there so i just wanted so that again that's saturday july 15th 2023 that this will be happening at ashtanga yoga atlanta at our actual here's the map right here it's right in inman park um right by crog street tunnel so anyway oh yeah i, I want to go i really want to go i'm hoping i i want my daughter to go with me but i may be there by myself because i don't know what her plans are you know 
It's fun. I have to teach. So for those who live in Marietta or in the Atlanta area, I will be subbing for my friend Cindy, who comes on this channel a lot. Uh, Angie, met Cindy, she's going to be out of town. So I'm going to be teaching her class on Saturday. And then, of course, my class on Sunday. So I will be at AYA after I teach um, my the class that I'm teaching for her on Saturday morning is a 90 minute class. So I'll be probably heading out of Marietta around noon. So I'll probably be at the Shala around 12 30, 1 o'clock, depending on traffic on 75. If you're not from Atlanta, I know that means nothing to you, but if you're, if you're from Atlanta or the surrounding areas, mm -hmm. you get it. Sometimes traffic can be a bitch in this, this fair city of ours. And I also want to make a comment before we get into the, the subject at hand. For those that were watching Solutions by Aquarius Rising Africa on Wednesday and saw me get booted, guess what? I was just telling Angie, a garbage truck hit a power line. And our whole block was without power yesterday. So today being Thursday, I have been playing catch up today because obviously I could not access my laptop. Um, and we had to go. We took Ravi, our dog, uh, down to Georgia Tech. They have a there's a big fountain at Georgia Tech in the. And so we let Ravi go sit in the fountain because it was so damn hot. I mean, it's hotter than Satan's asshole right now here in the South. So we had to get Rafi in somewhere cool because with no power, we have no air conditioning. So anyway, so if you saw me get kicked off of a, a with solutions, that's what happened is a, a, a garbage truck hit a power line. For once, it wasn't the construction workers. It was an actual garbage truck that knocked the whole block out of power. So, um, so yes. All right, Andy, any updates from your side before we get into our topic at hand? Updates from my side. Mm. I don't know. I've just been I've just been getting back into my Twitter lately. I've been like getting alive on it and just and just kind of like when I have a thought, I just like tweet it. And I don't care what anybody thinks. Great place <laughs> to be. Great place to be. It's so it's really fun. And I'll forget what all I've done. I'll wake up the next morning and I'll just go through it. I'm like, oh, people liked it and retweeted it. And or people thought it was weird or people here we go let me find this thing send me letters in the mail that they type you that, send a picture send my that. address they even typed my address on it you know like uh-huh and they say that you want me to read this they yeah you, like you sent me a picture of it but if you want the to read it for the audience go for it girl yeah it's good it's juicy hi angie you don't know me personally, but I've become acquainted with you by watching some of your YouTube videos. I felt led to write you to warn you of the dangers of the spiritual guides and teachings that you've opened yourself up to. There are demonic powers working through these mediums that ultimately have your harm in mind. What appears to be benign and captivating on the surface is false and deadly underneath. I implore you to go to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit through the Bible alone for guidance and instruction to make you wise unto the salvation of your eternal soul. Also, please watch the following YouTube video by Beckett Cook entitled, Yoga Isn't What It Seems where he interviews a former practitioner of yoga, a Hollywood actress by the name of Ray Darabont. Please understand that I write this in the sincerest way possible and not in the spirit of religious hypocrisy. I am just a sinner saved by grace through the blood of Jesus and nothing that I've earned myself. I'm praying for you. First of all, that video she's talking about has been proven to be propaganda. That's a propaganda piece set, set up by the church who is a cult. What a good little cult member she is. What a good little cult member. I, I'm, I'm assuming this woman has no idea that the Bible has been edited 55 times and that over 700 books from the Bible are hidden underneath the Vatican and that Jesus means hell Satan and that the real Yeshua never was crucified. I'm assuming she doesn't know that. That might, that might. I don't know who it is. I got lots of them out there. Lots of crazies out there, but that's very cool. They have my address. Yeah, it's creepy. It's uh -huh. fucking creepy is what that is. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're if you need to be saved by somebody else's blood, you might be a Satanist. Yeah. You might just be a Satanist. That is Satanism 101. Um, so, yeah, um, I would say that's projection, too. Obviously, this person is very uncomfortable in her own skin. And so, therefore, she's projecting that out onto you. Angie, your soul is fine. No, mm -hmm. you, no God, no God creator source would ever turn his back mm -hmm. on his own children mm -hmm. just like a 
a parent would never turn their back on their child source mm-hmm. creator would never do that. And I really, again, implore people to read the missing books of the Bible. It gives you a, that's the thing too, that was crazy with the Christian cult is that, um, when I first figured out through studying the missing books, of the Bible that Yeshua was never crucified, that made me very happy. Like I felt mm-hmm. liberated and it was like, Oh my God, of course he was. The real God would never demand that kind of torture. That's only what Satan does. Right. And so, and, but it's, it's crazy how many people want that blood. They're bloodthirsty. So to that person, we just say, bless your heart, honey. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Bless your, what is it? My grandmother used to say, little old darling heart. <laughs> bless your little old darling heart. Bless your heart. Anyway, we're just fine, honey. Angie's just mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. And maybe um, pointing one finger at Angie means you got three more pointing back at you, sweetheart. So maybe you should do some little self-reflecting there on your own. But speaking of cults, <laughs> yes. speaking of abuse, which in my opinion, Angie, that letter is a prime example of abuse. That's yeah. emotional, mental abuse. Mm-hmm. And it's terrifying that somebody sent you a letter anonymously to your home address that's terrifying that's like terrorism in my opinion Mm -hmm. um and i know i'm very sensitive to that now because of all the shit i've been through you do get very sensitive and um you know i uh we were going to talk today about another really important tactic of narcissist and of course when we open up the umbrella of narcissism we're also looking at high controlled organizations which also follow narcissistic it's all a playbook it's all the same thing And so we're going to talk about gaslighting today, which apparently, according to Dr. Romney, that was like the word of the year for like 2020 or something. Yeah, I I looked it up. I looked at it because I always wanted like, okay, what's the history of it? Like, why do they call it gaslighting? Um, And apparently it it comes from a movie from 1944 called Gaslight. I've never seen it with Ingrid Bergman and um, where I guess the husband is... um, you know, they had the, the, the lighting was fueled by gas. And if you turned a light on in another room, then the light in the room you were in, it could kind of dim. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and so she was, I guess, talking about that and he was telling her like, no, 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 you don't, you don't, that's not happening. That's not happening. It's your imagination. So I guess ga- gaslighting is, making someone question their own reality and reality. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, um, it's basically, that's the thing. That's about exactly where it came from. It's like, you know, when you're dealing with like a narcissist, for example, you will say, well, this is what happened. And they'll say, no, you're not remembering correctly. They'll deny your reality. And over time, with that amount of emotional abuse over time, it does start to whittle away at your own sanity because you do start to question yourself. And that's what then the movie, that's what he was doing was making the, the woman feel crazy. Um, another movie, as you are saying that, um, is an old movie with um, Betty Davis called Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte. Same thing was they were doing the same thing to her in that movie. They were mentally making her feel crazy. Um, they didn't call it gaslighting then, but that, is a terrifying movie. Some of those old movies from back in the back in those days before they had the, you know, CGI, it was all psychological. Like a lot of Hitchcock was psychological and that's far more terrifying than, um, than any other form of horror and being with a narcissist, being stuck in a narcissistic relationship, being stuck in a high controlled organization or cult is very terrifying. And you do have your own sense of reality, ripped from you and part of the healing process is actually realizing that you you were gaslit in a lot of situations you were not crazy you were purposely being gaslit um and i think sometimes people confuse gaslighting they think that it's oh someone's just lying it's not just lying there's like a a more nefarious manipulation to the lie um, I don't know if you want to take it from there, Angie, with some of your thoughts. And Well, in my own personal world, <laughs> with I've dealt with family narcissistic abuse. And, you know, there have been times when I've said, you know, oh, this happened. You know, this person, I don't feel comfortable around this person because this person is mean to me and my children. Um, and then 
I would be told, well, you know, it takes two to tango. You oh, know, I know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, well, I wasn't tangoing. <laughs> like, just actually just trying to um, fit in. But I was um, listening. We were we were driving back from Florida. I was listening to a uh, Dr. Romney podcast where she talked about the whole concept of high conflict relationships and that she didn't like that term because it's not high conflict it's just one person is creating conflict the other one isn't the other one is the victim of the conflict and so she addressed this that when you talk about narcissistic relationships and one person is an empath and the other is a narcissist it's not the the empath the victim is not the one causing the problems they are a victim to the abuse of the narcissist and so the conflict is coming from one side and when we say high conflict relationships it's often then thought to be both sides are creating conflict and it's that's never the case with a narcissist mm -hmm. usually the victim is trying their hardest just to maintain some type of of peace and it's the narcissist that is the one that is the conflict and um yeah because by the time i think by the time people at least in my own experiences and people i've known by the time you make the realization that you're in an abusive relationship so much has already so much damage has already been done to your mental health that you're not even in a place to be of conflict if that makes sense yeah it's like you're drowning i, I felt like i was just underwater just trying to stay just you know, anything I could do to, to keep treading, keep treading, keep treading, maybe one day, maybe one day, maybe one day. And, you know, no. So finally, I mean, I'm, I am dealing with it right now, just learning. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to put on my own life vest and, and not rely on that, that these people are going to ever become a boat that I can get on. <laughs> no, it's, um, and that's the hardest thing too, because narcissists are very charming and when they first meet you they love bomb you and then they you know you are there you're like a queen in a castle to them they put you on a pedestal you are their everything and then it's like overnight all of a sudden you're what's wrong with the world yeah. and everything is your fault and then there's this yo-yo that's going on and so you're constantly trying to figure out what happened to make you all of a sudden not be this loved person what did you do, do that's wrong and um i remember with my narcissistic relationship my the, the bad one that i was in the one where i almost lost my life and it was with somebody that i had gr actually grown up with but didn't really know him that well um and then when we started dating he was very aggressive like very much was like this is it and i remember saying to a friend at the time like this just feels really fast and my friend's husband at the time said but isn't that what you girls, you know, you're so lucky. Like you've got this man that wants to like marry you and like take care of you. You're so lucky. You know, now this is, this is what girls do. Like the minute they have a man that wants to, they just say it's too, you know. And so I started, my friend's husband kind of set me up to be like, oh, I, I must be entitled or I must be in the wrong. He's right. I've known this. I've grown up with this guy, so he can't be that bad. And then, yeah, now looking back, it was complete love bombing. It was complete um, getting that, setting me up for that narcissistic supply. And then once you're off the pedestal, you're off that pedestal. And you're usually in a situation where you're kind of stuck. It's not like you can just run off and leave. You, you, you've invested time and energy and finances and you're confused because you love this person and you yeah. think you've done something wrong. And you can't figure out what you did wrong. So you're taking the blame for the behavior of somebody who actually has a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with me, I've been very public for, for many years, just with my business and on all the different social media platforms. And in my personal journals that nobody saw, I would tell the truth. But then out for the public to see, I would make everything look wonderful. I think Dr. Romney has an episode where she talks about pictures and how, you know, you're always smiling in your pictures. You're not going to post a picture on Facebook or Instagram that's like, you know, I'm sad. You're, you're going to post like, oh, you know, date night or, um, you know, family get together, 
um, Easter, you know, whatever, but vacation, you know, and you're only showing that positive stuff. And so then whenever you really start trying to heal yourself, people are like, what? Yeah. I had no idea because you made everything always look so, so good and happy and cheerful all the time. Oh, yeah. you, I, it was the saying, you never know what's happening behind closed doors. And I was listening, if there was a very, it was a great interview that Dr. Romney did. And guys, I'll put all of her links down. And if you don't know who Dr. Romney is, I, she's my favorite as far as like a specialist when it comes to narcissistic abuse. She interviewed a girl who wrote a book about, um, I think it's called In My Bones. It's a woman, a, a woman who sur survived immense childhood abuse and ended up having complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which I've been diagnosed with myself. And so I was really interesting. It, it was interesting to listen to the podcast. And there's two things I want to bring up. She talked about the girl that wrote the book said, when you have PTSD, just plain old PTSD, which is bad. It's like, imagine you have a really bad car accident, and that really bad car accident. Now you've got some post-traumatic stress side of side effects. Now imagine having that really bad car accident once a week for the entirety of your life. That's CPTSD. That's the difference between PTSD and CPTSD. Mm -hmm. And when we think about PTSD, oftentimes we think about people who are coming home from war where they've got what's called shell shock. You know, it's very explainable. But a lot of times a complex, it's, this is why it's complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not as obvious to the outside world that there is trauma happening um, within the, and I actually, it's interesting because I've been through trauma therapy. I do know I have this. I do know it's something, once you have an anxiety disorder, it's never going to go anywhere. You just have to keep it at bay. And something this woman said also that was interesting that I never realized was a sign of CPTSD that I do. I just thought it was my Vataism, the need to try to be perfect in your, like to, I work nonstop, mm -hmm. I work nonstop. And I know that I could probably slow myself down if I, if I wanted to, but I do feel anxiety about that. And I didn't realize that was from complex post-traumatic stress disorder, but it almost acts the same way as like someone who has an eating disorder in that sense, where they feel like something that they can't, there's something outside of themselves they can't control. And so they can control their food. So in this conversation, I realize a lot of times children who come from abusive families will grow up to be very meticulous and very overly um, trying to be work too much, trying to constantly, because they're trying to control their their output in order to be accepted by the world around them because that's how they learn survival as a child. That hit me so hard because that's me. It's um, me. It's me too. <laughs> yeah. It's a sign of, and, and then I've tried this week, like I, I text um, our friend Emmy, who is a Reiki. I said, I feel like I'm in a depression. Like I feel like and I tried to been really, re really good to myself this week mentally and say, hey, you know, you've been through a lot and it's OK if you're a little slower getting some videos out. It's OK. Like you got to take care of yourself. But those are signs of, of, of CPSD, which come from things like narcissistic abuse, mm -hmm. because it's it's layered. It's not it's a lot of it's mental, emotional gaslighting. Another thing she said, and now this woman that wrote the book, grew up in an immigrant family from Asia. And so Dr. Romney is also in Indian heritage Asian. So they talked a lot about the um, cultural implications of certain races. And Angie, I thought about you and me when she was speaking about this. And, you know, of course, it's not vogue in modern and woke society to say, you know, white people have, is, you know, we're supposed to be white privilege, right? Mm -hmm. but I hate that. I mean, that's so racist to say that you and I are both from the South and I'm listening to them talk about the cultural ramifications. And all I could think about was white Southern society. Uh -huh. And I know this isn't Vogue for the woke crowd for us to say this, no. but in white, especially Southern upper class let's just be honest the aristocratic society mm -hmm. do you know how much narcissistic abuse 
physical abuse, mm -hmm. financial abuse is happening behind the door with the white picket fence around it. Mm -hmm. And you can't say shit. Nope. You are enslaved. Family. It's family, right? And your fa they come from a good family. Do you know what that means? Say you come from a good family in the South. They're rich. They're rich. Just and they're same. educated. Mm -hmm. They're rich mm -hmm. and they're educated. And I know both worlds because I grew up not wealthy at all. You know, pretty. I mean, I wouldn't say we were poor, but we were. We were. You know, not wealthy at all. My great grandfather, you know, worked in a fire tower and picked tobacco you know like he worked on a tobacco farm so i've seen both both sides you know so, um yeah you just got a smile i i and i think that's why i struggled a lot because i grew up in a narcissistic system the school i went to was i mean looking back now holy shit 90 percent of the teachers should be in federal prison right now for abuse some of them are um and i think i i said i i said a lot growing up like i i there was a side of me there's a sassy side to me that will speak back um and it made it worse for me obviously but i have told my parents i if i could change anything about my childhood well there's a lot i would change but the one thing i would change would be my name my name is my mother's maiden name and the bryces of south carolina are a good family mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah my, i love my granddaddy I didn't that's yeah. all I don't I didn't know his father you know but they were all doctors um the Williams Bryce Stadium at the University of South Carolina and to carry that name there's a certain expectation that you'll carry on the lineage as well and there are things about that that I don't want to, that that I think are wrong and um it's hard to and that and that's part of that that white cultural abuse basically is let's call a spade a spade right you know um and uh there's it's in, you're enslaved to to keep i don't know how to say that you're enslaved to keep up the story yeah let me see i wrote something i think last night let's see this is on my twitter have you heard of family scapegoating abuse it's a real thing and there are people coaches that can help you if you are a victim of this awful abuse let me know if you need help finding help i can send you some links and then what did i say um Da -da 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 -da. any situation where you notice a pattern is karma the key is to stop the pattern otherwise it's just going to keep happening generation after generation um here it is. If you are the family scapegoat, you do not have any allies within that family, only enablers. They are all either brainwashed to think you are the problem or they are too afraid to go against the narcissist because they don't want the, the lashback. I was a scapegoat 100 percent when I was in therapy <laughs> that that was bit, that was brought up the first day that mm -hmm. i uh, my therapist after we did some talking she was like you are a scape you are a prime example of a scapegoat child and I, told you I was like doing something on my twitter yeah <laughs> you're, you're saving the world one tweet at a time girl <laughs> <laughs> i was the scapegoat though and i i that makes sense this because i was the one i was the black sheep i wasn't like my family i was i was born weird like i was born mm -hmm. A, a lot of my my cousins you know i grew up with my cousins like brothers and sisters everybody just goes along to get along everybody's just following the norm and i never wanted to be th there i never i love my family but i didn't want i think i was i have another cousin now that has some tattoos but i think i was the first to get tattooed. you know like you know like um and i was scapegoated a lot and anytime i tried to defend my oh that was another thing too that happens to scapegoats anytime i would try to defend myself i got in trouble for defending myself i would be punished for that yep so for me it's that i'll put things out on twitter i don't say who i'm talking about but everybody just assumes because you're so vain you yep. probably think this tweet is about you you know because <laughs> because 
I mean, you know, they just assume it. And so then I was always like, just so bad because I'm telling the truth, you know, you know, I'm just telling the truth. I'm, and, you know, they, I'm not saying anything. I'm not calling out anyone, but spade is a spade. Spade is a spade. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, that's, that's part of the scapegoat. If you're the one that was the one, you know, I was the one out of, out of my sister and me. I mean, I, my sister can speak for herself, but it's, it's interesting. You know, you grew up with siblings in a house and you have the same basic childhood, but two totally different childhoods at the same time. Have I, you heard of Hayoka? Uh, uh. This is something new. I just, I just discovered a couple of days ago on, from somebody else's YouTube channel. Um, spelled h-e-y-o-k-a -E and there's like a hayoka empath and so basically you know empaths are already a minority but it's like minority within the minority like super like the wanderers yes yeah it's a uh, see i looked it up on wikipedia um it's a kind of sacred clown in the culture of the sioux of the Great Plains of North America. The Hayoka is a contrarian jester and satirist who speaks, moves, and reacts in an opposite fashion to the people around them. Only those having visions of the thunder beings of the West, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on. But there's a whole like thing on like nine signs and traits that you're, there's a lot. And every one of them, I was like, every one of them is me. I can't wait to look at that. It sounds like the wanderers. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're highly sensitive people who have a keen capacity to sense what other individuals around them are feeling and thinking. Empathic persons don't have the same filters which other people do to block out stimulation. As a consequence, they absorb into their own bodies both the stressful and positive energies around them. Um, da -da -da -da. It, there's a whole lot there. I want to do a thing on it. Because I really believe, I was telling Eric this, I was, last night we were talking about it, I was like, oh, I am totally this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm another thing. <laughs> I can just start putting labels all over me. <laughs> like I keep saying when I die, I'm going to be like, I need to speak to the manager. As my friend <laughs> Emily says, she's like, who left me? Who left me by myself to, to, to create this soul contract? No, that I, I have a really hard time, my nervous system. So if I'm in a situation where something isn't right, I at this point can't hide it because my nervous system starts like I start shaking uncontrollably. I can hardly speak. Um, my body starts to shut down. It is bad. Like I can't, I have a very important meeting. This is why we're airing this on or filming this on Thursday to be aired on Friday. I have a very important meeting tomorrow with a very powerful person i'll just leave it at that and she knows what's going on and i'm so I, I i feel comfortable with them like we've talked on the phone and stuff so i feel totally comfortable but my boyfriend's coming with me just because i know my nervous system like i have a so he can kind of be the grounding force for me um in this meeting because it's a very important meeting and it's hopefully will, will result in really good things but you know it, i that is i can't i have a really hard time um hiding my reaction to things well it says um you know hey are considered you know like the most valued of empaths because they are like the most <laughs> like because they they feel even more intensely than than just i guess just a run-of-the-mill empath but <laughs> son of a bitch awful. it's a native american term that means a fool or a sacred clown or <laughs> shamanic <laughs> It, the term is also used to refer to people who are emotional mirrors to the ones around them. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of things. I mean, it's it's really, really interesting to me. Um, they have sacred power and they share some of this with all the people, but they do it through funny actions, which I don't know. But yeah, um, a Hayoka hey, hey, empath is also called a pain eater due to his ability to absorb and cleanse negative energies around him. Jeez, it goes on and on and on. But yeah, um, I'll send you a link to the guy that where I, I was watching on YouTube. I was like, I kept hearing him say the word, but it wasn't in the title. And I just started looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> Randomly putting letters in. I've had to do that before. Like, how do you think this might be? Sound it out, Bryce. Sound it out. <laughs> I did win a spelling bee one time in fifth grade. 
like, okay. I'm like, this was not a wor- a, wor- a wordly wise word that we had <laughs> in school. No, but that's, you know, that's, that's, I think that's also though, though, that probably would be very much what they call the wanderers in the law of uh-huh. one. Uh-huh. Um, and that was one thing uh, I've said with Mr. Fox, Angie knows Mr. Fox, that um, when I first met him, he was like, you're a wonder. And that explained a lot because as I said, the episode I did with Catherine and Mr. Fox, you know, for most of my life, my adult life, I have been so abused mentally. I mean, I look back at my childhood and I'm horrified. I'm horrified at the abuse that I went through. Um, looking back, it's amazing. I feel at 40, it's amazing I'm still alive, to be honest with you guys. Like, it's actually amazing that I'm still alive. And so for a lot of my early adulthood, before I learned about narcissism, before I learned about narcissistic abuse, before I learned about the law of one, I thought that God had created me to be, I literally believed, like in my bones, believed that I had been created to simply be a punching bag for people. Um. I mean, there are so many examples I could say, but I'm not going to because I don't want to like put family members on the spot. Right. The one tweeted this morning that um, light workers are not victims; they're volunteers, or volunteers not victims, which is a really hard thing to to realize that we supposedly chose all of these experiences. Somebody better supervise me next time I'm <laughs> developing a soul contract. That's all I've got to say about that. I'll give you guys an example of, yeah, I'm thinking about an example of a family member. I won't say who, but of, of a good example of gaslighting and something. So when, when I was, when I, when my mother was giving birth to me on February 4th, 1983, um, my heart stopped in, in the, like I was being rushed into a, for, to be a cesarean section, but they got, they got my heart to start back again. So then I was a natural birth. I didn't know that until like my 27th birthday. I had no idea that it happened. So basically, I flatlined in the womb and then was brought back. So from the time I was born, I've been very sensitive to spirits. I see ghosts. I feel things. I don't know if that's because of what happened in when I was in the womb. Because a lot of people say that they'll, they'll have like a near-death experience and then all of a sudden they can see things. I don't know if I would have been able to see them anyway. So I just wanted to preface that. So when my parents lived up in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta, they had a new, they were the first people to live in their house. It was a new build, built. And upstairs, there was a man upstairs. I would see him a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm so used to seeing apparitions now that I don't really think much of it anymore. Um, but I would see him a lot. And I said something to another family member. And we had a good hour conversation about this apparition because this family member had also seen this man we described him exactly the same what what he looked like and finally i was like oh thank god somebody else is like seeing you know like so we had this full-on conversation and then like a month later we had this big family dinner at my parents house and i said something about the man upstairs and the person i'd had the conversation with was there and i was like oh remember we had that they're like no we didn't no we didn't that person did not want everybody to know that they had seen an apparition because I'm the crazy, I'm the weird one. Right. I'm the, I'm the black sheep. Mm -hmm. That's a form of gaslighting Mm -hmm. because we had a full on hour conversation about it. Wow. And that person basically just threw me under the bus because they don't want to be perceived because I'm the scapegoat. I'm the one that takes the abuse in the family. I've always been the one to take the abuse. Always. Always. Mm-hmm. I would laugh as a child and I would say, man, an earthquake could happen in like Ecuador and for some reason it would be my fault. That's how ridiculous a lot of the, uh, the abuse was. Like that was obviously nowhere near my fault. Um, I'll tell you, I went to school in the United Kingdom for college. And um, I got a call one morning from one of my parents. I won't say which one. They had, and I'm sorry to throw my sister under the bus, but I think it's kind of funny now. They'd found a um, some paraphernalia in my sister's bedroom for marijuana. <laughs> Whatever. Like, who cares at this point? 
but I got a call one day at now. Meanwhile, I had been over in the United Kingdom for months at this point, like hadn't been home and I was blamed for it. It couldn't possibly be my sister was actually doing that. It had to somehow be my fault. Like this I, reminds me of a story my mom would tell me about when she and her sister slept together when they were little and her sister peed in the bed, but like pushed my mama over on it so that she would get in trouble. But <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I, I know my, my parents now know that was my sister's, but I've yeah. never gotten an apology for that ever. Uh -uh. They laugh about it now. <laughs> and I don't, I tr listen, I have tried to be a pothead. I, CBD is great. I can't handle, I can, I love my shrooms, but I cannot handle um, THC. I can't either. It doesn't work on me. The CBD oil is great. So I tried very hard to be a pothead. <laughs> it just never worked for me. So, um, so that's kind of comical. And my sister worked real well on, like she, the total fish stoner and you know, they know that now my parents, know. but you know, that, that was just kind of the ridiculousness. And I think like, I was thinking a lot about, I was, I was um, watching a video about, you know, when you're in a relationship with someone that's constantly saying they're sorry, like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do that a lot. It's a sign of that that person has been emotionally abused in the past mm -hmm. that they're just, just good. They're they're It's like, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop all the time. Yes. I do that same thing too. You're constantly it holding drives my daughter crazy because she's just so she's so dang wise at 16 years old. Well, she had she's a like, loving parent. She's, like, she had a loving, she's yeah. healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, <laughs> when I mean, everything's been from the time you were a child, if everything was made to be your fault, then you start taking on that responsibility that everything is your fault. And I find myself now, like, even with my, my boyfriend, who's the sweetest guy, Angie knows my boyfriend, like, he hardly raises his voice. He's so kind. Um, he understands. But I'll be, like, here, and I'll hear him come home in the morning, and I'll be, like, working out or doing my practice or something, and I'll find a little bit of anxiety, like, oh, my God, I hope, I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for something. I still, every day, and I have wow. to, like, tell myself, no, you're fine. You're not. That's me, too. Like, I would always, when my husband was coming up the driveway, <laughs> you know, I've just, if I was just kind of like not doing anything, you know, just kind of relax and I'd just hop up like, oh, I better look busy. Yeah. Not oh, yeah. Because not necessarily because he required that. It's just, it's just in me from my child. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, it takes me a lot to take a day off because, and this is why, and I, I kind of spoke about this earlier. I don't feel like I deserve rest. I don't feel like I deserve to have a day off because that's how I was made to feel as a child from my, I'll say that was from my father. Definitely. I well, just I reserved for the first time ever an Airbnb on my own for me and my daughter for my birthday and in Charleston. And um, she's Rosie's never been. And do you know, it was such a big deal. Like I was like, no, no, it's too much. It costs too much. No, you don't No, Well, you really maybe just do two nights instead of four. Maybe, you know, no, you know, I kept going back and forth. I reserved it and then I canceled and then I reserved it again. Now it's just set. And, you know, I got a message back from the owner of this Airbnb and she knew who I was. She said, a girl after my own heart. I love I love me some fickles. I know so I'm going to bring her some. That's sweet. I gotta show you this place. I mean, it looks like something out of Pinterest. Send me that picture, girl. Well, you know, Charleston's where my mom's family's from. So mm -hmm. apparently there's a couple of streets. I apparently there's a Bryce Street somewhere and a Strom Street somewhere. That's my grandmother's family, the Stroms. I've never seen them. I've been going to Charleston my whole life and I've never seen those streets, but maybe I'll look for them. <laughs> look for them and just be like, I know, I know that bitch. <laughs> I, know. I know that girl. Um yeah, that's, that's, it's hard to do that for yourself. It's uh -huh. really, when I first started dating my boyfriend, he would say stuff like, when do you ever treat yourself? He would say stuff like, now I'll go get my hair cut in color because that's keeping up the illusion, right? That's something you have to do to make yourself look presentable. But mm -hmm. as far as like, you know, it, it would take me a lot to feel like I could buy a new shirt, right? Yeah. I could have a million dollars sitting in the bank and I would still feel 
because growing up, I was not made to feel like I, and my parents had money. Like I grew up in private schools, like we nice houses, like, you know, it, it just. Yeah. I, my, my grandmother, um, when she finally just, you know, grew up and healed herself. I mean, she, I don't know if this was healed, but she had a whole bedroom of nothing but shoes. You know, it was just shoes because she never had those things, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. And I feel like my mom, they used to, um, she tells me these stories when she was growing up, like the, the she, they would go get to the Salvation Army to get my mom her shoes. But the other siblings got new shoes. Um, so now I think my mama loves her goodwill, loves all the thrifting. I mean, she, she buys so much stuff all the time, you know, like, it's like, I don't know. There's something there. You know, there's, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's weird. It's, it's like one thing I want to cover at some point is obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, which I think people which is a sign of, of CPTSD is OCD, but I don't think people really understand what OCD is. I've been diagnosed with OCD as well. I don't know if I've mentioned that before. It's a, it's, it's a side effect of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's, it's a weird, it's not, yes, I'm a very clean person. Yes, I make my bed up. Yes, I'm very organized. But I think that aspect of my personality would be here regardless of trauma or not. I'll give yeah. you guys an example of something I do that's OCD because that being clean is not OCD. Being organized is not OCD. What OCD is weird. The proper OCD is weird little things you do that make no sense, but to you it's life or death. Let me give you an example. When I do laundry, I have it in my head that the first thing I put into the laundry basket after it's been all cleaned and put away has to be a very dirty outfit, like covered in sweat, covered in dirt. And if the first thing in the laundry basket isn't covered in sweat and covered in dirt, I have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. That's OCD. That's what OCD is. So I don't know where that came from. I don't know why I do that. I've tried to break that habit myself. Like I did laundry this morning. I'm looking at my laundry basket right now with nothing in it. Now, in my, if I'm in my OCD, the outfit I have on right now, after I get off with Angie, I would go outside and like walk or run five miles just to get this outfit really dirty so I could put it in the laundry basket. But the person that's trying to heal is going to say, no, you're just going to put it in the laundry basket regardless. It's like, I remember hearing Andrew Gold, I love his channel. Andrew Gold talked about him. He would have to hold, do his doorknob on his car so, so many times before he'd go inside and the doorknob actually ended up falling off. It's ridiculous stuff that you don't know where this quirk came from, Yeah, but it becomes life or death. So I don't know where that came from. Now I've been doing my own laundry since I was 12 years old. I was forced to start doing my own laundry at 12 years old, even when we had a housekeeper. Um, so I don't know if it's just trying to keep, I, I don't know what it is in my brain, but that is, that's OCD guys. And that's, so cleanliness isn't OCD organizations at no CD. It's weird things you do like that. That is OCD. Um, I have to shave my legs every day. Now I started doing that because I laughed because I'm a yoga teacher. So I didn't want to like, you know, students grab my legs when they, when I assist them. But now I think it's crossed into OCD again, where I would have a panic attack yeah. if that didn't happen. And that's coming from, and so I think it also, again, I hope I'm making sense to people watching. I think, again, I, I refer it back to people with eating disorders, because that I understand from my studies of the dosha. When someone is anorexic, it's never, it might start off as a diet, but it crosses a line into trying to control something because you feel like everything else is so out of control. I think it's the same thing with OCD. It's that there's something you are so used to being abused and you are so used to being the scapegoat that you're trying to control whatever part of your life you can. So there's some sort of peace and some sort of, of, of um, purpose. I don't know, maybe because it's the dirty clothes hamper, the first thing has to be then dirty. I, I don't know. Um, 
But I did talk about that with my therapist for a lot. And she was like, OCD is a part of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. It's recognizing that. I don't think I have that. I do in the laundry basket. I mean, I don't want anything wet in there. <laughs> you know? well, that's, that could be for mold, but. <laughs> but I don't think I have OCD about anything like that. Not even, not even about like shaving my legs or, you know, anything. Um, yeah. So yeah. I'm OCD about the bed too. Like I will not. Um, and this might be just from, I mean, you, like you, Angie, growing up in the stinking South, but, um, you know, I could go out, I could take a shower, get clean, go out to dinner and then come home an hour later. You still got a shower. I still got to take, I still got a shower. I can't, I, ref, I cannot, if, if for some reason I could not bathe before I went to bed, I would sleep on the sofa. Now, one thing that I do that's kind of kind of weird, I guess, but it's a good thing to do is um, on my bedside table, I always know like where my water is, where my phone is, where, you know, everything is like laid a certain way so that in the dark, I know like I'm where it is. And my husband would knock stuff over all the time on his table and just spilling stuff and like making a racket, you know, all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> why can't it was you? your space? It was your space that you were trying to, to why have can't you just put your water right there? If you knew, I mean, and then, and then don't just go whack, you know, to go grab it in the dark. Why don't you kind of slowly take your hand and go, where is my water? You know, like, like a oh. bowl in a China shop. <laughs> I will say my boyfriend's very clean. Like he's very clean and organized. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's weird. Those little, those little habits, but I know Angie, you grew up in some abuse. Um, so you probably have a lot. And that's why, that's why I dated narcissists for so long. It took me almost losing my life to put me in trauma therapy because I was mistaking abuse for love because I grew up with abuse as love. And, and now I'm assuming everyone's a narcissist. Like yeah. I'm scared. Yeah. That's um, well, actually, I just saw Dr. Romney had re released a podcast about that, about when you come out of narcissistic relationships, you're constantly eagle eyeing everyone. And I did that for a while. And, you know, the thing about narcissism is, and my therapist was really good at ex explaining this to me. Every person has narcissistic traits, every human being, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean they're narcissist. So, and she explained to me about healthy narcissism. So what is healthy narcissism? Healthy narcissism would be, let's say that Angie, tomorrow you got offered this amazing job that was like the job of your dreams. You got to travel the world making pickles and you were going to be on all the travel magazines and it was amazing. And you posted about it on Facebook that you were so excited. That's healthy narcissism because you're proud of yourself. Right. But you being proud of yourself in this moment for you as Angie does not mean that you've dismissed anybody else. Says, uh, you're still happy for other people's success too. Yeah. And that's the difference, right? That's the difference right. between a right. healthy person and a narcissist is that a healthy person can be proud of themselves, but also have strong boundaries and, and honor everybody as well. A narcissist, it's all about them. And if you're their supply in that moment, what do we mean by supply? You're giving them, you're feeding them. Basically, it's that organic portal. They're mirroring you. Mm -hmm. They're feeding off of you. And the mm -hmm. minute that supply is not good enough for them anymore, you're all of a sudden, they use you as a different way, which is to abuse you. And they, they need to do that because they don't abuse themselves. They abuse you. It's, it's all, it's really fucked up. A narcissist, their mind they seem, as Dr. Romney says a lot, they seem, you know, on paper, a narcissist is going to have, she said, you know, you take someone with narcissistic personality disorder and the normal person compare banking accounts, guarantee you the narcissist is going to have more money. They seem like they have their shit together. They seem, but they don't, they, they are, they're in their heads. They are very fucked up and that's why they abuse. Um, and that's why they gaslight. Wow. And they don't have empathy. They don't care. They can fake it when they need to. They can fake empathy. But they don't actually give a shit. Another really crazy thing that I do is when, um, so people, 
write me checks for pickles or anything, you know, I will hold them. I think, you know, it's like a three month window you have to, to cash or deposit a check. I will hold them till almost the last minute, like the last day, because it's like, it's like I'm saving the money. That's an OC, I bet that's an OC, I bet if you talk to therapists, that would be I do it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I always can find money though, because I don't spend it. If it's in the bank, then I'm going to, you know, my kids are going to need something. I'm going to Venmo them and it's going to come, you know, just, it's going to disappear. So I just like, no, as long as it's just this piece of paper, I can't spend it. Yeah. That, uh -huh. I think that's probably an OCD. Uh -huh. If you were to talk to a therapist at that, that a weird thing to do. It's so weird. I deposit checks right away, girl. Like I, I don't get paid. The only place I get, I get checks from Cindy still, but most people just is direct deposit anyway. But, um, but yeah, I bet that would be considered. And you, there's some practical reason in your head as to why you're doing it. Although you could just yeah. put it in your savings account in the bank, you know. And I used to like, I didn't, I didn't want to put it in the bank. So I used to put it in like a, you know, Duncan Hines. Uh, frosting container in my freezer i'd be like well if the house catches on fire the freezer's probably not going to burn first <laughs> okay i'm kind of like that okay so i rarely use cards i prefer using cash for things and i don't know why i don't know why there's some businesses i have a credit card i don't even have one i have credit cards i have debit cards but i will literally go and withdraw cash yeah, and I don't have my debit card because it comes straight out and I can see what's happening and I don't owe anything afterwards. Well, I, don't I don't even use all I mean, there are certain businesses where in my head I can't use cards at all. I'll just go get a bunch of cash. It's so crazy. I don't know why I do that. Why well, don't just pull my debit card out? I mean, online when I, I'll be, obviously use my cards, but it's, yeah, it's just weird little quirks yeah. like that. And um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I know we're coming up on an hour now, Angie, but I wanted to ask our viewing audience, our friends watching right now, because this topic seems to be so important. Um, first, I want to ask our audience for them to give any examples of gaslighting that they've experienced, if they care to share. Um, and I'm thinking, like, I'm feeling kind of inclined. Do you guys want us to go deeper into, like, complex post-traumatic stress disorder in an episode? Cause it's really a real thing. And a lot of people, like I've never been to a therapist, you know, and I'm, I know I have it, <laughs> you yeah. know, but, and the, I mean, a lot of people can't afford therapy. They can't, you know, and they, they're just not, or they're embarrassed or, you know, to reach out. And I think it would be really good to, to really get it, dive into it. Yeah. And just to know you're not, I, I so before we sign, I'll tell, so in my mid twenties, I was probably like 26 at the time. I remember this, I all of a sudden started having just explosive anxiety and i've had anxiety my whole life but it got really bad and so i decided i was going to try to go on some form of medication at that point because it was really out of control and so i went to i didn't go to a therapist i went to my just doctor because i wanted to get some, some medication mm -hmm. so it was 14 15 years ago something like that and i was telling the doctor what was going on and I remember the doctor looking at me and she said at that point, she goes, you sound like you have PTSD. She didn't say CPTSD because I don't know if CPTSD was actually a thing yet. And I remember thinking, no, that's something that people that go to war have. Like I've never been to war. I don't have PTSD. But I remember the doctor, the actual medical doctor saying, I think you have PTSD. Um, and it wasn't until my early 30s that I went to trauma therapy where I was actually diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And when the, the therapist was explaining it to me, it was very liberating because all of a sudden you realize the thing about the human psyche is you get so used to living in your anxiety. You get so used to living with your trauma that you don't realize that that's what's actually happening. Same thing with abuse. Sometimes with cults, a lot of times people don't realize they're being abused because they're just used to it at that time. It comes, it's normal. It's just a Tuesday, right? So yeah and the the different side effects um of complex post-traumatic stress disorder um i'll never forget and this can make me kind of emotional the the lady in the podcast with dr romney the lady said something about that wrote the book said something about being in her boss's office and like breaking down and crying and saying that she felt like she just couldn't be she was so weak she couldn't be strong in the morning dr romney stopped her and said no 
if you have complex post-traumatic stress disorder every day, you're carrying strength that most people will never even understand. Mm -hmm. What you've been through, it's that same metaphor of you've been in a car. It's like you've been in a car accident every week for your entire life. It changes you. It changes the, the neurological makeup of your brain. Mm -hmm. um, CPTSD looks a lot like ADD. So if you're an adult and you feel like all of a sudden you, and now you have ADD, it's a chance it's not ADD, but it's CPTSD. It's complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Your body's not supposed to be in fight or flight all the time. And that's what's happening when you grow up in abuse or you've been in abuse for a significant amount of time, you, your body just naturally stays in fight or flight. Fight or flight. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one more thing. Cause I'm feeling inclined. Cause maybe somebody listening, well, this will help somebody. I had a friend that used to laugh at me about this. I wake up when I was a kid. So there was a lot of signs that something was going on when I was a kid. I had um, night terrors starting at the in the eighth grade, which are not just sleepwalking, but not like, running out of your bed screaming. Um, my mother would find me in the shower with my pajamas on. She would find me in the kitchen trying to leave the house with my pajamas on. So I started having night terrors. Th those don't come out of nowhere. Another thing that happened, and I can't remember the name of it. There's a medical term. My uterus started to fall out when I was in high school. Wow. It's a was it pulverated? Like there's a word for it. They had to pop it back in, wow. and that is a sign of molestation. I don't have me literally memory, but in the '90s, it was just oh, just to, just put it back in, and we'll just keep put a smile on your face and just keep going, you know. Um, even to this day. I have to lock the bedroom door when we go to sleep at night because I don't know if I'm going to get up. Um, when I lived by myself, I there was one morning I woke up and I had gone into my closet and pulled everything out of my closet, all my clothes, all my shoes, and they were just lying on the floor of my bedroom. I had taken all the suitcases down, everything in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I do is I wake up in the middle of the night in a panic and I'll be like half awake. So this isn't like sleepwalking. This is, and I'll be running to the closet, getting things that I need. Like I have um, my doll hip, which I've shown on the show air before <laughs> um, that I, I, I go and grab her. Cause I, I need to run or my grandmother's quilt. And it isn't until I'm going to the bedroom door to run that I am half awake that I go, wait a minute. And I'll put everything back and go back to bed. Wow. So these yeah. are all signs. Yeah. I don't do that, but I do sleepwalk. I'm, I mean, I've been known to clean house in my sleep. Like I'll be polishing furniture with a flashlight. Uh -huh. That's and creepy. That's, <laughs> that's so no, creepy. That's, that's complex post-traumatic <laughs> stress disorder because your body's in fight or flight. So your body's not mm -hmm. actually resting. It's, mm -hmm. you feel like you got to be doing something. Do you talk in your sleep? I talk yes, in my sleep. I scream I in talk my sleep. sleep. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My boyfriend has had to wake me up quite a few times as I'm screaming in my sleep. Wow. Yep. So this is, and this has gone on for like 40, well, probably more like 25 years for me. Cause it builds up maybe even longer. I don't know. So I, I just hope people watching right now, like you're, if you're experiencing any of this, we started off the conversation with gaslighting. I know, Andrew, you were going to just see where it went. But it starts with things like gaslighting that make you uh -huh. start to question yourself and put you in that place of panic and terror. This is what, in my opinion, narcissists are terrorists. That's what they are. They're terrorists. And honey, they go to bed at night and they sleep perfectly fine. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. They sleep perfectly fine. Not a care in the fucking world. Meanwhile, they've just terrorized you. Yep. And you're up all night. And you're up all night. You're sleepwalking and you're developing OCD patterns and you're on fight or flight. Um, I know, Angie, I've said to you, I, I want you to see someone because I did EMDR therapy and I will do that again because EMDR therapy was amazing. Because when you're in fight or flight, 
So what EMDR, it's rapid eye movement therapy. So when you go to sleep at night, this is for everybody, when you hit REM sleep, speaking of REM, the band, they're from Athens where Andy lives. Um, when you go to sleep at night, when you get to REM sleep, which is the deepest level of sleep, your eyes start to move. And it attaches to like the neurons in the brain. That It's why the side expression sleep on it, that's where it comes from. And it's so when your body hits that paralyzed position so the body can re heal itself not act out your dreams and so you can go back and calm down the neurological responders in your in your brain that respond to stress but when you are inundated with stress like you're having that car accident every week your body is not able to process that so what happens is you never go into rem sleep you never get to that deepest la a level of sleep that's why you're sleepwalking that's why you're having night terrors mm -hmm. that's why you're screaming in your sleep because your body's not get your you're too much in fight or flight. Your body is not allowing you. Your mind's not allowing you to get there. What EMDR therapy does is it does what's supposed to happen in sleep while you're awake. Huh. So it's hypnotics, watching a finger, or some people do it with buzzers or lights. Um, and you do a lot of talk therapy first before the therapist does it with you. And what the therapist will do is they will bring you back to a very stressful, traumatic experience you went through they'll bring you back there and then they'll start right away having you watch their finger while you're in that emotional state to get your brain to rewire itself back to a healthier mm -hmm. and, and as my therapist says it doesn't mean you don't have to go through and do everything in your life that caused you stress because if as my therapist said if there's something you're not remembering we're not going to try to remember it if your right. mind decided to block something we're going to leave it blocked because there's a reason why your mind blocked it. If it and she told me with some mind blocked memories that if it hap if I happen to remember something, we'll deal with it in that moment. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're not going to try to push it because I I feel like I've got some little memories, you know, just like little pictures in my in my mind that I'm like I don't know what happened, but something something happened terrible must have happened because I I can see myself and the room and the person yeah but i don't remember what happened so it must have, yeah it must have been I, had I had so this is what's crazy guys with memory i remember middle school sixth seventh eighth grade i remember it like it was yesterday i am missing chunks of time from high school mm -hmm. i met up when i moved back to georgia from los angeles i met up with a friend i went to high school with I mean, we were in our late twenties, so I hadn't seen him in like ten years. And we went up, and we had beers one night. Just he was a good friend of mine in high school. We did a lot together, so we were just catching up. And he kept saying, "Do you remember that trip we went on?" It was him, me, and one of our other friends. We like went away on a trip to a cabin for a weekend. And I kept saying, "You're confusing me with somebody else." Like I was laughing. I was like, "No, I've never been there. I've never been to this state in this cabin." Like, no, that oh. wasn't me. He was like, no, it was you, me, and this other person. I, and it was a whole thing. Well, the next weekend, we met up again with another friend who was back. And I walked into his house, and he had gone into his attic, found boxes of photographs from high school, because this is back in the day, young kids, where we didn't have them on our, on our cell phones, and had, a, you know, those envelopes of pictures when you would get from the... And right. Threw, and threw the packet of, 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 of film roll down and said... The trip we went on look at these pictures i sat there looking i was sh i remember sitting there shaking because i was in all these pictures i have no memory of this trip no memory of going on this trip wow mm -hmm. now i know the friends i were with didn't hurt me because but what happened around that time that caused me to completely block out a huge chunk of time and how weird is it that I remember 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, but I have a hard time remember 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. It's hazy. Mm -hmm. That's when my uterus fell out too. So what the hell happened? And as my therapist said, we don't need to know. We don't need to know. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you can't remember, we're just going to work on your emotions. And that's all we're, and as she said with the MDR, we don't, again, we, we don't have to go through every traumatic event you have. We just got to work on some of them. And once we work on some of them, the rest of them, will your body will start to be able to incorporate that and work through it. Mm -hmm. mm. 
So it's crazy. Listen, planet Earth is gangster planet. I believe it. <laughs> I'm, next, next life, I'm going to Venus. We ain't victims. We're volunteers. <laughs> They call us wanderers. I must have wandered into the wrong planet. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> and I will tell you something too, because because I feel inclined to say it. So I don't have a relationship with my biological father. That was a decision that I made. Well, my stepmother blocked me on his phone anyway years ago, but that was a decision I made with my therapist. And that is something in the South that we are told we, we have to what, honor our parents. That's right. Honor thy father and thy mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the minute I was given permission to put up boundaries and I made that decision, mm -hmm. my life has been better for it. Yeah. I've, it's been healthier. I've been able to heal. Yeah. Yeah. It's that whole, um, we're getting way off topic again, <laughs> but the whole like forgiveness thing. And I think forgiveness it can keep you in that loop, yeah. Of, you know, of, of abuse over and over and over. Oh, I'll never forget my dad's sister, my aunt. She's a therapist, and I was probably in my mid twenties at this point, and I something had happened, and I maintained a relationship with my dad's family, even though I cut him out my grandparents and stuff. And I remember my dad's therapist saying, you know, Bryce, your relationship with your father is one sided. Mm -hmm. You are the one who is always trying to have a relationship with your father. And that took a lot for her to say that about her brother. Yep. Yeah. And to tell her niece who was in my mid twenties at the time to say, you are the one I haven't got, it's interesting. I haven't gotten, a, I haven't gotten a happy birthday from my dad since I was like 18. Or a Merry Christmas, not a text, nothing. And my last 40th birthday, my boy, I forgot. I just don't even think about it now. We had gotten back. I was a little drunk. We had gotten back from dinner. And my boyfriend was sitting on the bed, and I was changing to go take a bath drunk. And my boyfriend looks. He goes, your dad never called you today. And I go, oh, no, he, he never does. He never does. Yeah. And he said, but you're his firstborn child, and you turned 40. Like, I was just assuming he would at least text you. Yeah, I was like, you probably don't even remember it's my birthday. I guess so I was like, I was like laughing about it. He doesn't even remember. I don't even think he remembers I exist. So to be no. honest with you, it's so very similar situation with my dad too. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. yeah, and I guess we're all drawn to each other. Like my best friend, you know, Deborah, same. No relationship with her father. He died a year or two ago, and she didn't even go to his funeral. You know. Yeah, I think about that with my dad, like. Like, what day. are you going to do? Yeah, yeah, when he's on his deathbed, like, are my sister and I even going to bother? Yeah. And, like, how pathetic is that for him? Yep. I remember when my grandfather, my dad's dad, was dying. This is a visceral memory I had, and I, talk, I remember talking to my therapist about this. I was on the phone with my dad. And I was, again, trying to have a relationship with him. Uh-huh. And my grandfather was getting sick. And my father was in his 60s at this time. He was, my father himself was in his 60s. And my dad was like, I don't have time for this right now. You don't know what it's like to lose a parent. Mm -hmm. And I had to pull, I was shaking on the phone. This is before we had hands free. So we were talking on stuff on driving. I had my Jetta at the time. I had to pull my car over. I'll never forget the outfit I had on. I had on blue jeans and a red shirt. And I was in my Jetta. I had to pull, I was on the freeway. I had to pull the car off the road. I was shaking so bad. And I thought at that point, his mask slipped and I saw him for who he was as, as his daughter. I saw him for who he was. I thought you son of a bitch, you motherfucker. Yep. You abandoned your children when we were teenagers and you're in your goddamn sixties. And your father has been there with you every single day of your life, helping you, supporting you, guiding you. Yeah. Now your father, who's close to 90, is dying. He's not leaving you because he's choosing to leave you. He's dying. Right. You 
chose to leave your children when they were helpless children. Yeah. Oh, it still makes me so mad. I remember telling my therapist that and she was like, that's some clarity, isn't it? Mad is a good thing. <laughs> I was pissed. I was pissed. I was so pissed. And I, the fact that he couldn't even hear, he didn't even, ha and that's what Dr. Romney said in one of her latest podcasts too, about like, what is the one thing about narcissists? If you had to pick one, there's so many things about narcissists, but what's the one thing? She said self-awareness. They don't they have, don't it. have it. Mm -mm. My, no. It didn't even register to my father. I'll save another story I have about somebody for the next one. <laughs> you can do it now if you want, girl. No. <laughs> it's too good. <laughs> I will I say, in defense, I have a really great stepdad. I will say that to you guys. I have an incredible stepfather. He's awesome. He, I'm so grateful for my stepdad because I don't even think my nephew and nieces realize that he's not their like biological. I don't think they realize that he's yeah. That's how awesome he is. He's just their pop, right? He's their pop. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's an incredible blessing to us. Um, and you know, it sucks for my dad because I have a really cool nephew and nieces. They're awesome, and those are his grandkids. And he doesn't. I mean, he knows them. Yeah. Occasionally he'll see them, but yeah, they're all, I mean, my, my nieces are gorgeous. I mean, I just, I know everybody thinks they're nieces and yeah. but they're just like my, my niece, Jacqueline, she's got these big blue eyes and this dark, dark hair. She's got her dad's Italian side of the dark hair and these big blue eyes. And May is just toe headed. Like we were and uh -huh. chubby. She's like a little cherub, you know, and Carly, <laughs> my nephew is just so handsome and he's just the smartest little, he's so sensitive. He's a Scorpio. He's so sensitive. Um, oh. and he's so smart. He's, he's so, he's one of the smartest in his class. He's just so freaking smart. And he, he just cares so much about people from the young age. He was very, and I just think you, you're missing out on yeah. these That's beautiful like kids. My soon to be ex-husband's side of the family here. I'm like, they don't know my children. I've got three amazing children. All three of them are very empathic, very creative, very smart, very giving, good to people. They care, you know, and they've never been accepted or invited or, you know, been completely left out of things on purpose, you know. And so it's kind of the same thing. It's like, sucks for them because they don't get to know these wonderful you know <laughs> children but yeah and they never did so. i will say my dad's parents were very proactive with my nephew and nieces they were oh but oh my god I'll, at my grandfather's funeral the 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 pamphlet i was like seeing stars with the pamphlet because of the mention of like great grandchildren it was like my step my stepmother's kids yeah. And I wanted to sock my dad. I wanted to punch him in the face at that point. Because my grandfather, because he was the first to die before my grandmother, he loved those kids so much. And he, I have pictures of like Charlie holding his hand. And, um, you know, they would ask him about him. And when they, when they, you know, and having to explain to them when he died, what had happened. And, um, and that they and that they were so young that as they didn't go to his funeral because they were so young, but like you couldn't respect your father enough yeah. to let his great grandchildren have that moment on a pamphlet, yeah. a program for a funeral. Yeah, yeah, that's like that wedding that um, my children were all left out of. My son said, um, "If mean, you saw my blog post, I think I shared it with you." Yeah. Um, I'll never forget him sitting there. He's looking at the program and he goes, I'm saving this. He goes, this is hysterical. We're the only ones not on it. You know, all the other cousins had a role to play. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that wasn't me saying this to him. This was my son saying it. You know, he was in like eighth grade. Oh, you figure it out when you're. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like my, and with my dad, I mean, my dad's family, different from your situation, my dad's family were very involved. Like I had like 
I probably think my grandparents are probably like, what the fuck with my dad? Like, looking back and I'm like, my grandparents are probably like, what, like, what did we do? What happened? Like, what <laughs> happened? Um, <laughs> and I, because my mom tells this story when my father walked out and left us, my grandmother, my, my dad's mom drove up to the house and like sat with my mom and cried and just cried. And, um, they always sent, like, they would always send my mom, like, they, 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 they love my mom. Like that, that was their daughter-in-law. And, um, yeah, I, I will say my, my grandparents really did proactively be in, what were involved in our lives where my father couldn't be bothered. Yeah. You know, and, um, they would wish me happy birthday. So on my birthday mm-hmm. when they were alive, my dad didn't, yeah. they did you know and um and they would be they would with my dad when we were really little like little kids like with my mom's family with the bryces my mom's family we always i always felt very comfortable at my aunt's houses at my grandparents like very much like this is my family but at my with my dad's parents he treated us like we were guests uh-huh and even when my parents were married he it, it was very apparent that he would put his nephews and nieces before his kids his sister's kids took priority over my sister and me Mm. and um my aunt my dad's sister has three sons and i think that that i used to think well that might be why because my dad always wanted a son and he didn't have any sons thank god thank god i mean if he had had a, a boy that was effeminate or gay heaven forbid he would have lost his shit so Thank God he had daughters. Um, But yeah, so that's the, we were, my dad's, actually there was one Christmas where my, so my grandmother got diagnosed with dementia early on, like a while ago. And the fun thing about dementia, you guys, the fun thing about it is people stop giving, they, they don't give a shit anymore. They don't care. They just say whatever. They say whatever. And my <laughs> grandmother before that, she was very Southern, very prim and proper, you know, but after that diagnosis, she started letting things rip mm-hmm. and she could not stand my stepmother. So she would tell me every time she called her the C word to me once, I was like, <laughs> What? I didn't even know my grandma knew that word. Like, I was like, well, I'll never forget. We were in, I was driving her Lincoln, you know, and she was sitting in the passenger seat and she was like, that, she said her name is a C U N T. And I was like, yes, grandmother, she is, but so is your son. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, there was one Christmas where it was like the last Christmas I spent with my dad's family before it got too difficult with him and my stepmother. I guess my grandmother did not anticipate my stepmother bringing her kids. She only anticipated us. And it was a big to do that there was not enough seeds. And so my stepmother wanted like my sister and me to leave. Basically, mm-hmm. my grandmother went ape shit on her. And she was like, those are my grandchildren. They are always welcome here. You are not. <laughs> when I, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh-huh. That's some South Georgia coming out right there. It's the best. <laughs> the best. She had been holding that bad for like 80 years. And she uh-huh. finally just let it, let it loose. Um, yeah. And she would. She was down. So <laughs> <laughs> apparently my great grandfather, my grandmother's father who owned a dairy farm in Quitman, Georgia. When my grandmother's mother had died, he remarried this woman that my grandmother couldn't stand. And so she would tell me all the time that she understood. And she told me that my great grandfather's wife hated fake flowers. (laughs) So my grandmother and her sister, my great aunt Jane, who lived in Valdosta, would send her constantly fake flowers. flowers. That's good. And she couldn't throw them away because it was Paul's girls. Like she had to save them because of- I love it. That was the first time I was like, "Ooh, Grandma was sassy." Yeah, she got a sassy side to her. That's so funny. So, but she saw I me. Mean, she literally like saw the behavior, and and basically, I mean, you know, she would before she passed away. 
we would go visit her and she would like shove money in our pockets. And I think she's hiding that shit from my stepmother. I was about to say her name, but she's hiding this shit from my stepmother. <laughs> she's like, trying to like shove money in her pockets so that. <laughs> anyway, we've gotten so off topic, guys. We got way off topic. <laughs> Where but... complex post traumatic stress disorder <laughs> comes from? <laughs> fake flowers and absentee parents. <laughs> I love that fake flower idea. Got, I've, she you, hated you, my grandmother Marianne hated fake, fake flowers too. <laughs> My grandfather grew his own magnolia trees in the backyard and was constantly, she hated them too. But yeah. her and her, I was like, you and, you and Aunt Jane were kind of bitchy, weren't you? <laughs> you know, I have to take some notes. Y'all know how to do that. You know how to be petty. You're petty betties. Like, <laughs> so good. So good. You're giving me ideas. <laughs> yeah, so good. Oh, get the tackiest fake flowers next Mother's Day. <laughs> Send it to your ex-in-laws from your grandchildren. From their, she can't throw it away because <laughs> it's from her grandchildren. So she That's can't right. throw it away. That's she right. got to display that. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, guys, I know we just said we were going to have to kind of uh, free flow today about some of these topics, um, but please know everybody watching that. I know Angie's going through it. I've been through it. You're not alone. We're at a time in our great awakening where there is a divide between people with souls and people without souls. And so it's becoming more and more obvious. And it's that's a good thing that it's becoming more obvious and that more people are aware of these tactics and um, anything you see in a narcissistic relationship, just amplify it by 10 and there you have a cult. It's all the same stuff, right? So anything you want to part with today, Angie? With our audience? Uh, I think we've said it all. <laughs> Is there anything else amazing on my Twitter? <laughs> if anybody wants to connect with me there, I'm Angie T I. <laughs> so I'm kind of fun on Twitter. Um you're fun, you're fun uh, off Twitter too, Angie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I don't know. I'll play this. What? Oh, where'd it go? I lost it. Hold on. I'm going to find it again. You might hear my channel. I got to go to my community tab. Hold on one second. Yeah. My last tweet was how dare, you know, like that Greta, how, how dare you? Anyway, how dare the scapegoat not subscribe to their fucked up narrative? Thought that was good. That is good. How dare. <laughs> and I will say guys, one last time, if you want Angie and myself, to become middle aged TikTok. Oh, yes. Please. Okay. Hey, Kelly, tell me you know, come on, tell y'all, but we're going to walk black pages. Y'all didn't think that I could walk like I'm gonna, I'm going to get this. I was going to walk black pages. Turn around and I'm going to get this. Oh, my God. Okay. I have a TikTok, but I don't ever share anything to it. Um, but I don't TikTok, but I don't know how to fucking work it. I might just keep going there and like trying to figure it out. Listen, we're gonna embarrass Angie's kids. They, they're they're used to it. I mean, I've been embarrassing them since forever. I wanted my sister to do some flashback from the nineties, like in sync stuff, and she's too busy chasing kids to even know what TikTok is. So I can't be the cool aunt Bryce by myself. I need cool cool aunt Angie, Mama Angie, and. Tell us if you want us to do learn some TikTok dances. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> That'll be fun. So I really yeah. like that song too, and it's not really my genre of music, but I like that song. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, guys, we love you all. Let us know mm. your thoughts down in the comment section below. Share anything you want to share that might help somebody. Um, watching and reading this that needs the support um, and let us know if you have any ideas for any narcissistic topics that you want us to explore more I have some other people I'm going to be contacting again to come on and talk more about narcissism as well to really help people understand that you're not crazy you are not crazy you're an imp you might even be a heyoku was that what it uh, heyoka heyoka you might even be a heyoka <laughs> <laughs> there's so many labels <laughs> oh goodness well I just, i'm just like what the fuck is this like 
I kind of like the way hey yoga sounds. Okay. I'm a hey yoga. <laughs> hey yoga. <laughs> all right, you guys. We love you all, and um, we'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>